Hey everyone, welcome to Crypto Options Unplugged. This is our brand new podcast where crypto meets macro. I'm your host, Imran Larka from Options Insight, and I've got my co host here, Dave Brickell from FRNT Financial. But today, because it's our launch episode, we've got a very special guest all the way from Chicago, Greg Magadini from Amber Data. Hey guys, good to have you here. Hey, good to be here. And welcome, Greg. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, guys. Happy I was so psyched to hear you're in town because I've been meaning to talk to you about what you think about Crypto Vol with all the craziness going on with the ETF and Vols. So let's get into it, boys. What do you think? So we'll start with you, Dave. Yeah. Because you are the macro legend. <laughs> tell us, I mean, macro's pretty hot right now. So tell us what your story is in macro. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think um, the macro story into this year is a bit of a, a continuation of a theme um, that, that we were kind of trading a lot for, for 2023. And that is largely this kind of transition from this sort of vicious rate hike cycle um, that we, we endured to, to now moving into a cutting cycle. Um, and I think like last year we were kind of in that transition mode where we went to essentially slow down to the pause and, and now this year we're pricing in, in the actual cuts. So you know we had that dovish Fed pivot in, in December which seemed to catch people off guard um, where the Fed are now kind of explicitly talking about rate cuts um, you've got all the major central banks this year are about to embark on a, a rate cut cycle. Um, so I, I think that's one of the dominant themes. People are getting a little bit hung up on like when the rate cuts come and how much. But I, th I think from my point of view and from a, a big picture macro, it's about the, the, the sort of path of tra travel. So, so we're going into this rate cut regime, um, which I think is going to be supportive for risk and, and for crypto. Um, on the liquidity side, we again if i look i think liquidity really bottomed like in november 2022 and for the people out there who don't really understand liquidity we're just talking about money in the system really right that's sloshing around to find its way into asset prices that that's probably the most simplistic way sort of to look at it and, and I, I always say post 2008 the financial crisis where we saw central banks intervene and, and essentially um, artificially inflate asset prices because that was the collateral underpinning the financial system. We now, in my mind, are very much a function of rates and liquidity. So th this liquidity factor, this cash in the system, plays a huge part in terms of just broad, broad risk assets. And and you know, crypto is the biggest like liquidity junkie out there. And part of it underlying that is this currency debasement story, right? Um, so we kind of need to look at measures of liquidity. If you go back to 2022, central banks, you know, there was this global draining of liquidity that started to return to markets. Now, there's a couple of interesting things with that. So China are pumping a lot of liquidity, right? They've got a slowing global economy, a deflationary economy, um, a housing market crisis. So they're, they're pumping record amounts of liquidity. Into how the how are they doing that? Is that just through buying bonds and stuff? Through, through various sort of lending operations right. um, into the banking system. Um, so well, it seems to be doing any good to their stock market, though, right? No, no, and and, and like the the idea of liquidity as well. It's like you know, where does it flow, and and how do we look, you know, look at it? Um, so, but, but China are pumping liquidity. U.S. liquidity, despite the quantitative tightening and re re reduction of the balance sheet, that's actually been expanding as well. And, and we spoke about this before. So you've got the d different factors that make up U.S. liquidity or dollar liquidity. One of them being the uh, what we call the RRP, the re reverse repo facility, which is essentially excess cash that gets parked at the Fed overnight to earn essentially Fed rates. Now, that's been coming back into the market where we have this kind of spiraling um, deficit that the US Treasury are trying to fund. And they're doing it by issuing T-bills, sh short-term bonds. That money that was previously parked at the, f at the Fed overnight has been coming back into the market to get these high yields where the Treasury are issuing these bonds. So that's been like quite a big uh, liquidity injection into our market. Now, probably for me, the most interesting thing to start this year is we're starting to see the Fed talk about tapering and ending quantitative tightening. And that's a big theme. I still don't think markets have really priced. Logan, the Fed's Logan, made probably the more explicit comments on this and, and tied it to, to this decline in RRP. 
And I think the worry is once once the reverse repo gets to zero, how are they going to start funding this deficit? And one thing we know for sure is that if you if you if you've not got that cash to come in, then to be doing quantitative tightening where you're adding to the supply pressure, um, you know, there, there's going to be all sorts of funding problems. And we had like a funding crisis back in 2019, mm -hmm. and the Fed I think are aware of that and know that at some point they're going to have to start tapering that quantitative tightening. So not only coming into this year are we going to see rate cuts, we're also going to see the end of quantitative tightening and this balance sheet reduction. And my view is that we'll actually end up seeing them have to expand the balance sheet again, which is a hugely positive dynamic for, for crypto um, and, and risk assets generally. So I kind of feel like if 2023 was like the crypto spring, we're about to now launch into crypto summer. Nice, nice. So let's uh, over to Greg. I mean, let's talk a little bit about this, the, the big story in crypto right now, which is imminent ETF approval, right? It's been on everyone's radar for over six months. It looks like it's pretty much a done deal, although we had some shenanigans last night <laughs> with the SEC and their Twitter <laughs> yeah. account. What do you make of this? Do you think it's fully priced? Do you think we get to sell the news? How, how are you reading it? Yeah, so I think the way I view it is like in two parts. There's a short-term reaction and sort of the medium to long-term uh, reaction as well. So medium to long term, I think this is very constructive to a trend. North American assets under management, about 53 trillion. Bitcoin market cap, about $850 billion. If you add 2% allocation to Bitcoin, it's about a trillion dollars. Buying a trillion dollars worth of Bitcoin doesn't double the market cap. 5Xs, 10Xs the market cap. You're buying along the way. So I think you could see a sustained trend. Financial advisors, portfolio managers, pension funds, stuff like that, being able to buy a clean ETF that gives you that exposure. You don't have to roll it. You don't have to worry about decay like the Beto asset that has that contango funding. Um, so I think that's kind of the long-term trend. The trade, the tactical trade is a little bit more uh, difficult, I would say. So in the short term, implied volatility, last I check, seven day implied is about 75, seven day realized about 60. So you're looking at about a 15 point premium to realized. And you can think of the event as a one day event. So the di differential of 15 points times seven is about 105 points plus the 60 realized. So you're looking at 165 day of event. Divide that by 20, you know, call it about 8% move. So that's kind of what's being priced in the event itself. I think yesterday was the biggest tell. We had sort of two all events mixed into one. One is we got the approval for five minutes. And then we got the disapproval for five <laughs> minutes. So the market kind of showed its hand on how far it's going to rally and how far it's going to sell off. Now it's a pretty low realized volatility sort of reaction, in my opinion. So sell the vol to me is the sell the news event. I think sell the vol is, mm -hmm. is the way to do it. And you, you and I have talked to us about, about yeah, this. Yeah, well, it's echoes of the uh, the ETH merge, right? The, big, the last vol event I can remember that had, was anything similar to this was when we had the ETH merge, everyone was excited about the move to proof of stake. Everyone was thinking ETH could, it could either go wrong and ETH could have a nightmare or it goes really well and ETH re-rates higher. But the idea was everyone was looking for 20% type moves in ETH and implied vol on ETH went from normally five to 10 vols above Bitcoin to trading 40 vols above Bitcoin or something nuts like that. So that was the clear, easy trade. And I was banging on about that with all my subs for weeks into it you've got to sell that vol and I've kind of been on I've kind of been on the tape saying the same thing for this one although it's not quite as pumped eight percent implied move is kind of what Bitcoin can easily do mm -hmm. when it feels like it so it's not crazy mispriced but it's just that we are likely to chop around on the news but maybe we'll find ourselves where we are now about 45k in a week's time yet the event has passed and the vol can trade at a normal level and for me a normal level in crypto is going to be like 50 to 60 vol in the near term right so that's what i'm kind of looking at the, the, the thing that's interesting within all of that is the role that narratives play in our markets so we've had this great narrative for for a while now and into the spot bitcoin etfs mm -hmm. so then all of a sudden overnight you've lost that short-term narrative and I, I agree long term there's this positive demand shock um, that's going to probably keep propelling us higher in my view um, short term, yeah, you probably all the spec money that kind of trying to front run it comes out. But the interesting narrative for me is then, right, well, what, well what's the next narrative going to be? And then we're probably starting to think about the spot uh, ETH ETF 
um, and and when when that starts to get approved. So maybe like, what are your thoughts around that? Is is that the next trade we start to position for? And is there a, a relative value trade where you're maybe sort of long EFO and, and short the Bitcoin bowl? I'm interested to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, this is something again I've been talking with my subs about for a while, which is. For most of last year, Bitcoin vol traded above ETH vol because Bitcoin was the driver, the dominant narrative. Yeah. Bitcoin dominance was rallying. You know, the, any any rallies were on the back of Bitcoin going up and kind of dragging things with mm. it. Right. That started to change when we started to break out from sort of 40k and above. That actually started to change. And whilst ETH wasn't necessarily outperforming in spot terms, the vol was starting to flip round because the vol market is very forward looking, and the vol market isn't saying what's going on now, it's trying to look for what's going to happen in three to six to 12 months, right? And we started to see two things happen. We we saw less overwriting flow, which was selling of calls on Ethereum because margin requirements went up, people were getting hurt because selling those calls was costing them money because ETH rallied. And then you had people actually then demanding calls, call spreads, longer dated things in ETH, and the call skew on ETH was going bid, mm -hmm. which was because people are saying, yes, the next narrative will be ETH. Once the, e once the Bitcoin ETF news is done, that's the next play. So we want to position for that early. Greg, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I've, I've been kind of back and forth on this. I think fundamentally, a smaller market cap should have more realized vol. You know, Russell 2000, you know, small cap assets move more than large cap stocks. So I think that makes sense therefore supportive of more ETH volatility. Then you got to think of like the implied flows. We've seen sort of that call overrider that you just mentioned, you know, people buying ETH, staking ETH, selling calls against their staked ETH. Well, that's a supply of paper. So, you know, even if realized vol is about the same or maybe a little bit higher than Bitcoin, if the implied market has a supply of paper, that kind of smashes the variance risk premium. And it kind of, it's just hard to hold that paper profitably in the long term. So that's sort of the counter argument and sort of back to the circle or like circle thinking, well, with a spot Bitcoin ETF, we might actually start to see those institutional flows of buying puts, selling calls and holding Bitcoin. Because if, if the assumption is traditional finance will buy Bitcoin and hold it, they'll sell paper against it like they do stocks. So you might get that same type of overriding flow in Bitcoin which brings us back to the ETH fall should be higher than Bitcoin fall. So to me, we're still in the chopping zone. I don't think anything is settled. It's really hard to discount 2023 in terms of what we've seen in terms of Bitcoin volatility being higher than ETH. Um, I think the market is positioning for a, a future where ETH fall is higher, but I don't think we're necessarily there yet. So I think we got some back and forth period probably the next six months. Yeah, I mean, the, the cross rate, the Bitcoin versus ETH cross rate is at quite an interesting place, right? It's mm -hmm. on a major support level. And it's kind of threatening to break it on the downside on that knee-jerk higher on Bitcoin recently. But it seems to have held, I think, overnight without a 5% rally in ETH on not any particular news. So, yeah, we're, we seem to be a, a bit of an inflection point. Something that I noticed, and I'd like to hear what you guys think about it, is obviously we're talking about the bullish narratives within crypto. Mm -hmm. But when we saw that flash crash last week, when there was rumors of a rejection, you know, Bitcoin dro dropping near 10% intraday was not a surprise. Mm -hmm. But ETH dropped just as much. Mm -hmm. So that correlation is still really, really tight between the two. And I thought you might get a world where ETH actually starts to hold up better than Bitcoin on the downside in crypto. But that's not the tell that the market gave us last week. So what would you make of that? I still view as... ETH, the crypto tech play, Bitcoin, the alternative monetary asset class play. If I'm looking at the tech play, to me, there's a lot more regulatory hurdles in the tech play. If you look at ETH EIP 1559, a lot of the value prop there is the, redu the reduction in supply of Ethereum through transactions. Well, if we just kill DeFi, is there still the same engagement in Ethereum? Is there still the same developer sort of enthusiasm to build on top of Ethereum? I don't know. So I think the regulatory hurdles for ETH are greater than they are for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is classified as a commodity. ETH is a little bit ambiguous, but ERC built on top of ETH is pretty much exclusively securities. So that to me is still the the major headwind. 
Um, so I think there's still a, a regulatory headwind for ETH that we don't see for for Bitcoin. I think I think as well, like the, the point that you made on the um, ETH that overwrite of flows, and, and there's like really good reasons for that with st stake your ETH and and then sell sell paper against it. It, it probably kind of artificially artificially suppresses like the the, the inherent volatility in, in a smaller market cap coin like like Ethereum. So I think when we have these like flash crashes or anything, you know, it's still like the the, the lack of liquidity there. Um, I'd still expect you know bigger moves in in Ethereum. Um, I, a higher beta asset. It's just a higher beta asset. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of how I see it. I do think as well like we, we we've seen like the ETH Bitcoin cross come come lower. And everyone's trying to kind of bottom pick that, which is always mm -hmm. kind of like quite dangerous. And, and I, do, I did wonder if, if you know, we kind of just tripped some levels on because we, we were like knocking on some really important tech levels around that. So maybe maybe that that kind of filled into it. It's, it's interesting now, like over the last 24 hours, you're starting to actually see um, ETH outperform Bitcoin. Um, so may, maybe we've kind of, you know, had that flush out. And now actually maybe now is the time when you start to see ETH outperform. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I think... Um, that, you know, the, you're always going to have kind of Bitcoin leads, and then then the rest of the the altcoin space will will have a higher beta, and, and when we get these flashes, you got, you're going to feel more pain in the altcoins. Um, back to the macro story. Mm. So obviously, we the market is agreeing with you. It seems risk assets <laughs> risk, asset, risk assets have rallied. Certainly, cryptos rallied. Mm. But there's a few very smart macro commentators like the Jim Biancos out there yep. who are saying that. And also Variant Perception, who I'm good friends with as well, over there, they're all saying that leading indicators on inflation are suggesting that inflation's bottomed out, right? So whilst the story the Fed want to give you is, yeah, it's going back to target, some macro guys are saying, there's things going on in the world, like the what's going on in the Red Sea and the supply chain bottlenecks that might come with it. And there's some things that are making us think an, an econo economy that's more resilient is leading to a bottoming out of inflation and maybe six, five or six cuts are not really going to come this year. So does that put a spanner in the works on that narrative? And is that a risk that we as crypto holders should be aware of uh, and should be thinking about? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's fair in the sense of, I think there was a resilience in the US data last year that, that you know, kind of dragged out the cycle longer than I was expecting. One, one thing I would say is that it's really difficult to measure the lags of monetary policy and and I kind of just kind of call it like 18 month there's an 18 month lag from when you start hiking rates for it to start impacting on the economy so I kind of think into this year and the first half of this year we're going to really start to feel the bite from the the hikes that that went on over the last 18 months so I don't think we're yet to fully really experience that um, Obviously, like risks to that view are, are some of the, the tensions we got in the Middle East. And if you had an oil price spike, I mean, like, I, I think oil is really interesting in that it probably just shows you how how global growth and demand is so under pressure because mm. we, we've got a yeah, war no in the Middle spike. East and there's no real spike. And it's yeah. kind of edging down. We've got OPEC cutting supply. Um, and yet we still kind of, you know, pushing that in WTI at 70 bucks a barrel sort of level. Is that is that because China is just such a big disinflationary drag? It's huge. And, and, and I think everyone's kind of underestimating that 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 sort of disinflationary pulse that that's sort of going out across the Western world. You look at something like the producer price inputs. Um, I mean, certainly Europe, I, I, I think Europe could I, I think Europe could be looking at deflation within the next 12 months. Mm. Um, Again, you look at like say producer prices. So, I, I, I think um, I think everyone's kind of we, we were kind of um, like traumatized by the inflation we saw. There's a lot of macro guys that still live in this 70s world, which I don't think we're in. Um, I, I still think we've got huge disinflation. If I think of the disinflation headwinds, uh, debt, demographics, technology, debt's bigger than it was ever that it's ever been demographics are still sort of pretty poor um, and then technology and, and the advent of AI which has probably been one of the biggest stories over the last year um, it is going to in my mind continue to put this disinflationary um, sort of weight on, on, on our market so I'm still leaning towards the, the fact that we'll, we'll probably undershoot as well the, the other thing that's interesting to me is we've come from what nine ten percent U.S. inflation to now like, what three percent falling? The idea that we're just going to nicely just get down to two percent and just mm. sort of sit there. I, I think the likelihood is you know we see this whipsaw effect where actually we massively undershoot 
And when you're in a high debt economy, deflation is a much bigger problem than inflation. And the, the, quiet, the quiet bit that the Fed will never tell you is they're probably quite happy to see 3% inflation if mm -hmm. no one's talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and they can gently inflate away this debt. So I kind of think the Fed, I kind of think the bar now is quite high for the Fed to be worrying about inflation too much. Because I think as well, they're worrying about about the other, um, some of the, the issues in, in with liquidity, um, how are we going to fund this deficit? There's still a lot of banking issues that are quietly sort of lurking in the background. We've got commercial real estate. We saw Calsters talking about a 30 billion dollar hole that they need to plug, um, which I believe was kind of linked to their, some of their commercial real estate exposure. So there's a lot of issues still kind of lurking under the surface. And I think the Fed are now, that we've done our job on inflation, we can now start thinking a little bit more about those. So that's why I don't think it's going to materially change your story in that we're going to start seeing rate cuts. It's just about about how deep do they go and, and, and what have you. Okay, nice. Anything to add on that, Greg? Well, I think that's really interesting. So it sounds like the only potential catalyst for some inflation would be supply chains being disrupted through like geopolitical risk. And kind of like what you guys touched on with oil, we had sort of the spike in October and now it's just completely dragging. Um, if I think about Bitcoin, both with the Ukraine attack from Russia and then the October attack in Israel, um, Bitcoin rallied really hard on that news. Mm. So it's almost like in either scenario, Bitcoin wins, because if there is an inflation shock, it's going to be a geopolitical shock, which is bullish for Bitcoin. And if we're done with inflation and we go to a lower rates environment, well, then the macro rates environment is supportive for Bitcoin. And if Bitcoin is sort of the back to the cross rate between Bitcoin and ETH, um, if if damned if you win, damned if you do, damned if you don't, but in the positive sense for Bitcoin, well, that's really a, a good catalyst for Bitcoin to continue to outperform other cryptocurrencies from a macro perspective. From a micro perspective, you know, bull markets are usually good for altcoins, but yeah. that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, and, and I think one of the biggest developments for Bitcoin last year in, in terms of, you know, when you think of this like maturation of, of, of it as an asset class was, was this kind of, it was always just this high beat of risk on asset. And all of a sudden it kind of developed with, with some pretty like, um, you know, from the TradFi world, um, authoritative kind of guys speaking on it. It became this flight to safety Which all of a sudden. It's incredible to me. Mm -hmm. like, I can't believe it. Yeah, so, so like you say, and I, I don't think it's going to lose its risk on high beta kind of characteristic. So, so you're kind of ca covering both towels, right? We, we go. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is itself. So it's kind of, it kind of again, like, yeah, mate, it makes it, it makes it such a good asset to, to hold. What about gold, right? Where does that fit in? I mean, you know, that was starting to show signs of wanting to rally, looked like it was going to break the all time highs, failed, disappointed everyone again. Is this all this ETF approvals and more insto money being more comfortable investing in Bitcoin? Is that why gold is struggling? Is it a case of people just see Bitcoin as a higher quality hedge for a lot of those scenarios and gold is just losing its shine? Excuse the pun. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I mean, that, that's my view. I, I think the more you understand about Bitcoin, um, it's just it's just a better, you know, quality asset to, to own. Um, and, and more suited for this digital world. And, and I think like gold generally has probably been quite disappointing, right? We, you, you've had, for gold in my mind, you've had the perfect set of you know, circumstances. You've had high inflation, you've had um, geopolitical tension and war, all, all the arguments that, and, and I mean, it's performed. It's, it's kind of kind of done its job, but you've not got this outperformance. Not explosive performance. Not explosive. Steady Eddie. So, so we kind of, in the best case scenario, does okay. And then, and then there's the scenarios where it's just, it's just going to fall. Whereas Bitcoin is giving you this explosive performance that, that you know, what 150 odd percent last year. Mm -hmm. So I, I think people come around to the idea that if I'm going to hold some towel risk hedges, Bitcoin is a much better one to hold than gold. Yeah, and the truth is, like for those who, and you know, we're talking about options a lot, and Deribit offers all these products. Once you get your head around how you can be long crypto. And, and put risk reversals or put spread collars around it to protect yourself. And me and Greg can, sh you know, bounce this around a little bit. But the idea is that that's what I've been doing. I've been long crypto since last summer. I've been very bullish. I've been the ETFs probably going to happen. And especially with BlackRock getting involved. So I'm just going to lean long. I'm going to top it up with some optionality. 
But now that we look like we're pretty much priced and there's a load of open interest up at 50k, which the whole street is long because people have bought call spreads. It's, I thought there's just no way we're really going to break 50k on the news. So I'm going to start hedging myself out. And I don't have to get rid of all my crypto. I can still keep my crypto. I can sell some upside calls above 50k strike, 60k strike, whatever it may be, which continues to give me upside up to that level. And I can use that premium to buy put spreads or puts to protect myself. And I think once people realize how to do that, that means that owning crypto with a hedge in place will always blow gold out of the water, right? Mm -hmm. You've got no reason to hold gold when you can own the higher beta, higher risk asset, but understand how to hedge yourself. And and that's, I think people, like I'm here to educate people and hopefully we can teach people how to do that together. Greg, anything to add on that point? Yeah, I actually like trading gold a lot. Gold is one of my favorite asset classes. It's a really- Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love trading gold future options. It's, it's one of my no, but I agree places. with you that like, gold's interesting. And I thought gold was going to break out and vol was going to pop when it broke out to all time highs. But it was just an epic fail on that move. So do you still think that's going to happen at some point? So here's how I view like sort of gold's like path. Gold has like this weird phenomenon. We got to remember it was a $35 asset until we got off the gold standard in the 70s. And now it's you know a $2,000 asset. And it was a $35 asset for the previous 100 years before that, or, or $20 an ounce for even longer than that. So it really is a fiat alternative. Um, but when we trade like gold vol, it's very interesting. Gold does nothing. It's a 14 vol asset. It's super boring. And then you have some sort of event and it just kind of like legs up instantly. And it legs up a couple hundred dollars. And then, you know, the war narrative calms down a little bit and it's a sell the gold vol moment i you know now that we're above 2000 i could easily see it being 2200 2400 but again we're talking about bitcoin 40,000 to 100,000 it's just it's not directly comparable but I, th I think as like an alternative to fiat gold is tried and true it's been around for thousands of years um, it's going to be lower beta just by just by definition. But from a vol perspective, just just great place to be done done in that market, and it's a liquid market as well. And I know I know you've been trading those gold options. You, <laughs> you told me about some of your trades last year, which killed it. All right, guys, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap this one up. So um, why don't we go through go around the room with some key, what what's the key takeaway you want people to have uh, from this conversation? I think mine is we're still from the macro side of things in a very positive dynamic of heading into a lower rate world, major central banks cutting rates, liquidity is picking up. Combine that with the halvening, which we've not even spoken about, um, and the, the likelihood that we get these spot ETF approvals. Um, you know, I, I think it's a pretty explosive combination for crypto this year, and I'm expecting a, a, an even better year than we had last year. Great. I think for me, short term, the main takeaway, I think post ETF announcement, uh, you know, vol, Bitcoin vol goes down a lot. I wouldn't be interested in selling dailies, but I'd be interested in selling 30 days. There's enough juice there to make it worth it. Um, and I also think longer term, you know, we grind higher. And I, and I think 100K Bitcoin makes total sense to me. Cool. And uh, I think my, my key takeaway is just that I think if you've done well in crypto over the last year, now is the time to be putting some hedges in place if you haven't already. In fact, you probably should have done that last night. But the point is, have some hedges in place because the reason to have hedges is it empowers you to trade the volatility. Because if we were to get a dip for whatever reason, you would then be in a position to add risk, to take advantage of the opportunity. I agree with Greg, vol is a massive sell on Bitcoin right now. And then the whole Ethereum trade we've been talking about, start positioning for that. That is going to become the new narrative and you want to find ways to own Ethereum and using optionality is always going to help you out. All right, that's it for today's episode. Thanks for listening, everyone. We're going to be here every week. We'll see you soon.